Rose uh, gave us two Huntsman dumps, two steamy dumps today. Well, hello there, FC Dallas Curious fan. Welcome to another fun-filled edition, and I mean fun-filled, of Third Degree, the podcast. Hi, I'm Peter, and with me today are my two good friends who I love to talk about FC Dallas with. First, Dan Crook. Hello, Dan. Hey, Pete. How's it going? It is marvelous. This weather just makes me tingly inside and happy all over. I can't wait for fall. I'm so excited for That's it. That's a stomach flu. Oh, well, then I'll go see the doctor or something. Uh, and also, of course, your hero and mine, editor and founder of ThirdDegree.net, the good Buzz Carrick. Come in, Buzz. Hello, Peter, calling in today from DFW Airport, where I'm staked out looking for Cobra. <laughs> oh, hold on, podcast <laughs> listeners. If you're new to this podcast, uh, that means you're here specifically for the Cobra stuff that Buzz tweeted and uh, teased earlier today. You're going to have to sit tight before we get to that because we have more important and inter- and ultimately, really, frankly, interesting things to talk about, including the loss. The guys fly up, lose a game in Minnesota, and fly back, and that can't be fun. Boy, that was a weird game in Minnesota last night as FC Dallas lose 2-3. to three. And because I'm fairly certain most of this pod is going to end up being one of those tough love-sounding podcasts, guys, I'd like to start off with the good. I want to talk about one of the best debuts I've seen of an FCD signing since Mauro Diaz's first appearance. Andres Ricarte last night, coming in at halftime, man, that guy gave everybody a reason to have a little bit of shiny hope for the rest of the season, didn't he? I thought you were going to talk about Dante Seeley right there. No. No, no. Yeah. I, obviously, look, um, Ricarte uh, did was terrific and amazing, and we saw, even though it wasn't flawless, we saw the visionary passes, these amazing curling balls, everything that you want out of a 10. But on top of that... We also saw what I had alluded to from the videos that I had seen, the fact that he also plays defense. Now, he doesn't go back to the fullbacks. I don't mean that. He plays defense like Paxton plays defense. He presses. He has, what did he have, 10 defensive actions, I think, was the number. Like So you're looking at, yes, a playmaking player, a free eight, a 10, whatever you want to call him, but a modern one, one that plays a press, one that plays defense, one that is a two-way player, even though he's an attacking player. And that's super exciting because that, fits the system and he looks like a clinical high level smart player demanding the ball as a 10 should wanting the ball wanting to make assists wanting to make plays it was exciting in fact dan am i is it wrong for me to say that it almost seemed like the team didn't know how to play with that type of guy because it seemed like he disappeared for a little bit um, in the middle of the second half when he wasn't getting the ball very much and you could see him demanding it and he was having some trouble getting his teammates to get him the ball. He was uh, he was definitely dropping further and further deeper. Just uh, I mean, in an effort to get the ball. At one point, he was back in the box chasing uh, Reynoso ten yards back out of it. it was. Uh... It's so quite an impressive one to see when you think of the uh, defensive effort that Mauro Diaz put in in one game once upon a time ever. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's a guy of great size. He's a big dude. He's not a little dude, um, but he does play a lot like Paxton does. And I got to tell you, the in the first 30 or 45 seconds of him coming on the field, uh, somebody plays him a ball literally in the middle of the field, and he turns and plays an attacking movement to himself to go into empty space. And I thought, that's it. That's the player this team needs because that's the only guy on the team other than Paxton that has done that this season. Um, and, and, of course, he uh, followed that up with a really smart, decent pass and really overall played a really, really good 45 minutes of soccer for the team. Um, and, and like I was thinking to myself, uh, playmaker. Yes. Thank you. Ball yeah, I, winner. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. That too. Yeah. That was the moment for me was when he checked wide and pressed the guy against the line, stole the ball off of him. It took like two dribbles and then fired that sweeping ball behind the defense right into space for Barrios perfectly weighted for Barrios sprint. That moment to me, I was like, Oh golly. You know what a what a what a player that and what a level. Of course, now do it more than one game. Of course, just one game, but super super reason to be excited if you're a fan. 
And that was the most Pete has been excited about anything to do with FC Dallas in at least four years. <laughs> yeah. Well, definitely. other than me, okay, to be fair to me, I get pretty excited when Paxton's playing well. No, for sure, that's true. And, I, and the idea of him and Paxton playing together is now interesting, how you pull that off. So All right, so year. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let Dan kind of dreamscape that out. What is the dream midfield now if you have a fully healthy Paxton Palma call? Ooh, that's a tough one. Uh, hmm. I mean, Paxton can technically play that, that link in eight row. That was definitely something that Lucci wanted to make happen at one point. Then where does Brandon Savania go? Because Brandon has, has done things to, to earn a place overall. Maybe yesterday was a little bit quieter, but he was also playing as a double pivot. Ah, ah, this is difficult. I don't put Paxton out in the left wing because I still think that's a weird place to shove him. Oh, God. Help me out, Buzz. <laughs> yeah, well, that's why you hire uh, a ex- veteran experienced coach with lots of tactical nuance to figure that out. Oh. Oh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Lucci's going to have his hands full. Like, if he has everybody healthy, that's one of the... When, when you have a roster that has two good players at every position, which is what you want if you're at a big-time legitimate club, that's that becomes hard. It's not easy. And so that's where you hope a coach will have experience and know what he's doing. And I'm not saying that Lucci doesn't know what he's doing, but we've had moments where the inexperience has shown and Lucci's going to have a difficult job on his hands when all these guys are healthy and all here, of course, because there are going to be a lot of call-ups. Paxson's going to be involved with the Olympic team if he gets healthy, probably the senior team if he's healthy. So is Jesus, Cervania with all these teams too. I mean, there's going to be a cost to be missing for – uh, you know, his country. So there's going to be times when he may only have Ricarte left, but there's going to be times where you got everybody and then it's hard. Yeah. I, it seems very obvious and clear to me what this starting midfield three is. Uh, and that's Santos playing a single six. And now that Paxton's hurt, it's Acosta assuming that he continues in the form that he had showed in the last couple of games and Ricarte uh, playing some sort of dual eight uh, or combination thereof. I mean, that seems so as that seems as obvious to me as it gets. Am I, what am I missing? No, no, that's, that's true. You're on the money. The, the, the only questions then become, how much does Cervania press Acosta? Because it'll be one or the other. And then how much does Paxson press Ricarte? You know, or in a dream stretch scenario for Andy Swift, perhaps, can Paxson learn how to truly play linking eight? Because right now he doesn't. So, you know, I mean, L- Andy thinks he does, but Lucci doesn't and I don't. So, hmm. you know, those are your questions. Because right now, basically, Paxson healthy has to go head to head with Ricarte for a spot on the field. All right, so let's go back and uh, touch on your point about Lucci and experience and, and, and having a difficult time coming up because one of the things that I was really surprised uh, that came out of the game last night was uh, it seemed like the media and the fan base seemed far more interested in talking about Lucci's outfit and nowhere near enough about his starting eleven. Yeah, the three four three. 3 um, Tactically, I understood that. Because I totally buy into the fact that two of your three center backs are outright slow. And so I get it. It narrows the gaps. That's fine. It allows one of those guys to be more aggressive, covering and stepping up. I get all that. Now, Hollings said in the middle is mystifying to me. I don't understand that one at all. And clearly, it didn't work. And clearly, Ryan immediately makes a st- mistake that directly leads to the goal. And clearly, when they flipped it back, it instantly got better. So I, I don't understand that one. My only thing I could grasp at straws I come up with was that Lucci trusts Ryan and he has faith in Ryan. And so he put Ryan in the most responsible position. I think it, I think it was a bad choice. Personally, I think he overthought it. But and Ryan and, and, and Ryan uh, copped to all of that afterwards, right? He did. He, yeah. Uh, yeah, he did. He took it all on the chin and said, you know, that, that mistake. And he said, outright, my mistake really set the team back and that the idea was to press and that that just didn't happen for 25 minutes in the recovery from from that um i think you know in addition to what buzz said you know ryan holland said playing in the middle kind of opens up more in the attacking side we saw it actually come to fruition at one point where ryan was able to be the the spare defender you know the aggressor and he chased down to the the center circle to tackle Kevin Molino and then pinged a beautiful ball out to Ricardo Pepe that you know he should have done better with. 
but that was after. But that was after the switch, wasn't it? I think it was. I think it's after they. I thought it was after they switched back, but you know, he still had the same freedom role, even though he switched positions. Um, I mean, personally, I would have liked to have seen Brisson in the middle and and Holland's head covering the the right wing back. But um, you know, there's definitely definitely reasons for the shape they went, even if they. You know, it may not make a whole lot of sense to us. All right, because I, one of the really conflicting uh, performances that came out of this game was Brisson, who, by and large, I, I have not uh, had really good, uh, you know, a, a really good opinion of. But he really, you know, uh, did himself good last week and sacrificed himself in the prior game. And I, I do wonder if he still has that ball mark on the on his rib cage <laughs> from several nights ago. But again, I you know I when I see Brisson out there, especially early in the game when he's doing what you just talked about, Dan, which was chasing his mark all the way out to the middle of the field and getting pulled way out of position, and then turning balls over and getting caught out of position. I, I where are we on Brisson and his value in this team? Well, I'm, I'm with you, Peter. I'm not a big fan. Um, I think the last uh, the last game he was quality in the second half, and I thought in this game, once they changed, he was fine. But this is honestly the first time since he's been here that I thought he was even just okay. And I'm still not. I mean, okay is not Matt Hedges. Okay is just, you know, okay if I have to. So I, I'm I'm with you. I'm not buying him at the price he costs on the budget, on the price of the salary, you know? I mean, as a backup, his quality of play is acceptable for a reserve, but not when you balance it with how much money he's getting paid. So, Dan, what, I don't know enough about Brisson's history to know, does he have experience or is he naturally a center back in a three-man back line where he plays – the middle center back or one of the, you know, the left, the right center back, or does he come from a history of playing in a four, an, you know, in a four man back line? What, where, what is Brisson's natural position? Christ, I have absolutely no idea. Uh, oh, okay. We, I didn't know you didn't know. That's okay. We when, can edit this out, but I just, I wonder, I thought maybe you knew. No, I mean, we can talk about it. when he, you know, we, since he's one of the guys that, that's happy to talk to the media. We do get to uh, see Bris- a little bit of Brisson on those uh, weekly Zoom calls, and he does talk about, you know, the tendencies of playing in a back four and difficulties of, of switching to a back three. So I definitely feel like he's probably coming from a background of playing in a back four. Um, you know, kind of funnily enough, when, when Lucci talks about his an option for right back, he he kind of goes, well, you know, I played there like once or twice, but I'm not really good there. <laughs> we agree with you, sir. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Well, I, I do wonder about that because, I, th- you know, the, the clear thing out of last night was the missing piece, which was Hedges, who really glues all of that together. Rito's fantastic in general. He just obviously is a little bit older and not super fast. Um, although I don't, I don't, I don't remember anything in particular where he was, uh, where he would have gotten a bad mark. Am I missing anything from Ziegler's night last night? Nothing specific to that game, other than the fact that you know his declining step and Brisson's declining step are the reasons why effectively you're going to three in the back. I mean, other than that, no, they were both perfectly acceptable. And Reto's actually pretty much always better than acceptable. He's always in the good to really good category. It's just 34 and not great anymore. That's all. Also, that thing where every team is now trying to really target Johnny Nelson, which is funny because Nelson has been phenomenal defend- defensively. So Reto, um, when you look at like his touch map, he was pulled so far over to the left compared to what you'd expect to see even for the, the left-sided centre-back in a back three. So the real difference in this game, not only after uh, Brisson and Ryan switch positions, which helps you know kind of shut down or clamp on the fire that was <laughs> clearly burning and raging at the early stages of the game, but the shift at halftime when they bring in Ricarte and then go to a four-man back line, the, it was like two completely different teams. And I've thought this for a while, that this team just never looks comfortable in a three-man back line and hasn't dating back to Oscar Perea's days when he would try it out. Um, I, 
do we think now that Ricarte has shown himself and appears to be a guy that maybe Lucci will just settle on playing with four in the back? I don't know. I, I think, you know, we've been talking for several weeks now about um, Dallas getting dominated in the midfield. Um, you know, you can do it in a three man back line if you play, I think, three, five, two, because then you have that number 10. So then you get three in the midfield and with your two wing backs, you've got five and you control the midfield. And after the change to the back four, the same thing happened. You ended up with a triangle in midfield, right? So you're able to control the center part of the pitch, the most important part of the pitch. You quit getting overwhelmed in midfield. So it's not necessarily a byproduct of the three man back line as much as it is a lack of a third central midfielder, a lack of the triangle. So once he solved that with Ricarte, the possession came up and Dallas dominated the midfield. Um, all right, so let's kind of run through some of the other guys. I mean, Dan, anything else you want to add about that particular element of the of the change in the game to from the three in the back to the four in the back? Uh, no, like you say, just uh, a lot more comfortable, a lot more of, of what we come to expect from FC Dallas. Uh, certainly get the, you know, the 3-4-3 three, three worked really nice against the Minnesota Press in the home game, but that was a team who didn't want to be in possession and kind of you know, sitting back against them kind of works in your favor, but with Renault, so suddenly they are now, uh, hey, let's let's keep possession of the ball. Great, we'll just pass it around you. Uh, they they have that that element they've been with, missing for, uh, well, I guess since they lost uh, Quintero. Um, you know, it, it's good to see Lucci responding to two things like that. We've definitely... Cited in the past that FC Dallas has been a little bit one-dimensional, not enough of a plan B. Um, yeah, uh, you know, it, it really good to see the fight come out of them, starting from just before the, the second half and, and forcing that change. Yeah, you know, I, I there were several big changes in the game, and there were some clear moments, more specifically in the second half than anywhere else, where Dallas actually felt like you, you got the sense that maybe there was an opportunity for them to uh, fight back in this game, probably more so than when the third goal happened. Um, uh, but what I noticed more than anything else was this thing that Dallas historically has been very good at for a while, which is just going vertically and playing the ball deep forward uh, very quickly. And when they do that with Barrios and whoever else is playing on the left side, in this case it's Pepe, um, they seem to actually have some – they seem to catch – teams on their heels and I just wonder if we're not going to start seeing that more often I know it's not the most attractive style of play but it does seem to be the one time when this team is the most da- they're most dangerous well that's the um what we used to call the Pareja counter punch um you know that happened when he was in charge of this team and it's something we've been missing here the last we've talked about on this podcast that it's been missing, that there was missing a verticality from the left side of the field until Fava Pico came back the other day, and then it was present again. And then Barrios too has been not been executing that part. And then in this game, once you had Ricarte on and Tessman, who also is really good at long balls, both of those things opened him up a little bit. And they had 48% of the attacks down the right side. Dallas did. That's nearly pretty much 50%, right? So um, clearly they recognize it. And, and it obviously is a problem and an issue for Lucci to work on. You still got a problem on the left side that has to be solved. And then in the middle of the park uh, with Cervania and Santos playing in a combination uh, of a dual pivot, uh, I, I don't think it's uh, I don't think it'll be a surprise for anybody to hear us all agree that maybe Brandon didn't have his best game, or we were maybe a little disappointed in his performance. I mean, he was okay. You know, it wasn't great it, for me with Brandon right now. He's missing some of the range, some of the box-to-box play, like the real dynamic brand in Cervania. Now, maybe it's part of that role. Again, right, we saw the same problem with Acosta when when the first couple of games were like, why is he sitting so deep and not doing anything? And then all of a sudden he did. So maybe Cervania has the same problem. Maybe those instructions he's getting are to stay home. You know, let's see some verticality out of him there. I'm hoping it's layoff, return from injury, fitness that's causing this problem with Brandon combined with perhaps instruction uh, because he doesn't look very good. I mean, he's not doing anything right now that makes me think that Acosta won't walk, walk right back into the lineup as soon as Acosta's healthy. And uh, Bar- this was a game where after a few weeks of us kind of bagging on Barrios and hell, we even talked about selling him last week. This was probably one of his better games up until the moment when he blew it. Which time? 
<laughs> uh, on the breakaway where he did the really nice play where he stole the ball deep in the attacking third and had a one-on-one with the keeper and he had Hara uh, running off his right shoulder and instead of passing it off he tried to shoot which probably is equally a good opportunity except he hit it about five yards wide well it was I mean he definitely uh he definitely shanked that when he was trying to curl it around the keeper and he just he healed it um but there was also that chance in the first half when uh, Reynolds played him in, keeper was off his line, kind of tr- scrambling back, and it was really just a simple pass it into the net, and he just smashed it off the crossbar. Or, so would you disagree with me that this was one of Barrios's better performances? It or- was one of his better performances, but he's, uh, I know they, he got a second assist. Um, I don't know, maybe it, that was a monkey on his back, but it seemed like... He could play the overlap passes to Reynolds really well. You know, his his actual game was back, but it was that fine. Anytime he had to deliver a final ball, he was, you know, almost overthinking it. Um, and then let's move over to Mr. Frank O'Hara, which uh, seems to be building a less and less consensus amongst the fan base and media as to his value on this team or where everybody's kind of opinion of him sits at, after, you know, what I guess now is what five performances with the club yeah um listen the, there's so much to like the positioning is amazing the game read is amazing the, the the touch the things he's trying to do the level he's trying to play at they all look fantastic but the bottom line to me is that he looks slow i mean like like really slow and this is a vertical dynamic league where you have to be able to take your guy and if you can't take his guy I question how much play like the whole team around him is not going to be able to play to that crazy high level that he's thinking. And if you can't do it around him, then what's the point of him thinking and playing that level if it's not working? So I I think there's a problem in terms of like the style he wants to play and the way this team is built. He's even to me, Dan, I don't know if you agree with this. He's even starting to play like a false nine, right? Rather than a real nine coming deeper and deeper. And you're going to have to move your wings much higher to get it to work. It's frightening. It's, it's very confusing to be honest. Well, look at the, uh, that, that ball that Riccate played the outside of his right foot to Barrios when Barrios got pulled down early in the second half. You know, that comes about because Riccate plays that little, a nice little one, two with, with Hara on the touchline close to the halfway line. A, that's a pass that, you know, that's a pass that no one else in the team is really thinking to do. Um, and B, he's that far back and that far out wide as a striker. It's totally a false nine. Well, is it a, okay, you're calling it a false nine, but that's not what Lucci wants him to play. And and the and immediately the thing that I keep thinking of is all of our frustrations with Blas Perez way back in the day when Blas would like literally run all the way back. And it was like watching a dog chase a squirrel. Like you couldn't get Blas to stay in the box to save his life. Yeah, that's the problem is like the formation theoretically when they drew it up and like we're running it out there, the 3-4-3 three, three, and even the four two three one. it's designed to have a real nine and not a false nine. If you're going to have a false nine, you have to tweak the formation. So it's like if he's going to continue to play as a false nine, A, we need to all recognize that, including the coach. Presumably he has. And then you have to adjust for it. You can't just keep hoping that he'll eventually not play as a false nine. It's like, it's like Maxi Uruti, right? You knew what you were going to get from that guy. He was going to chase all over the front, right? Press the crap out of everybody. But like when you needed him to be a high center nine, he's not going to be in there. He's going to be back. So this is the same thing. This guy's chasing all over the place as a false nine, which can work. That's fine. As long as you are tactically adapt for it, you can't just hope he's going to eventually start playing as a high nine. He's not going to. Well, okay. Or even, you know, if, if someone is going to play all that and take in Blas Perez in his young years, not the 2015 Blas Perez, that's great if he's got the pace to get back and forth uh Hara doesn't he's got the pace to track back or just stay up all right so I'm gonna play uh devil's advocate or defender of Hara here how much of the lack of what we're seeing out of him is just the is the fact that he's just not getting a lot of good service yeah entirely possible yeah it's entirely possible he's coming back looking for the ball yeah that could be that could be part of it too we got it we have to get somebody to tell us and they may not want to tell us unfortunately (laughs) I mean, I don't really, honestly, I don't see... I mean, did he even have a shot last night? I think he had one. 
Did he have any good? I mean, I, I, I clearly don't remember any good opportunities for him. I mean, I, the I, only good opportunity was that one he should have hit first time, and he took, and I counted it, thirteen touches before oh, the defender right. pulled him out wide. Yeah, he had one t- shot. Technically, it was to the corner flag. <laughs> yeah, looking at the chart, literally. <laughs> did it? Did it go out at least for for a goal kick and not a throw in? Yeah, it looks like it goes out on the right side of the flag to be a goal kick. But okay, um, good. <laughs> yeah, that was his only shot. There's some saving face right there. Yeah. I mean, I'm looking at his pass shot right now. He has three passes in the final third. Everything else I, is in midfield. Because I'm pretty sure Dan uh, is right behind me on the uh, uh, on the Sunday League list for shots that went out for throw-ins. Yeah, I play as a center-back, so I've never actually had a shot go out <laughs> for a throw-in. <laughs> And Peter, aren't you an outside back? So they <laughs> no, I'm more yeah. of a pacey winger type. Uh, really. oh, are you? Oh, all right. uh, no, not really. <laughs> the I don't know. You were that that time that we played together. Was I? A, did you did you leave thinking? Oh wow, Pete's rather a pacey winger. <laughs> no, it was the day that one of your boots broke and you couldn't find tape to tape them back together. Oh, and I was like, that's right. Man, poor God, soul. I loved those. I loved those uh, pair of Nikes, and they the sole came flying off when I cleared a ball out, and the ball went one way, and the, the sole of my shoe went in the other direction. <laughs> That was a bad day. All right, um, and so let's uh, let's also uh, shine a bit of light on the kids that played last night. We had 17-year-old Ricardo Pepe and the very young Brian Reynolds, and we'll get to the other kid here in a second. But what about the two kids that started the game? Any uh, any impressions, good or bad, either way, neutral? How are well, we thinking? Pe- Pepe obviously is a little out of position out as a wing he keeps running in and playing like a second striker which for me is perfectly fine when you're talking about Pepe playing that position it's not what you want you want Fafa Pico out there but as a makeshift I actually liked it better than I liked Jesus Ferrer out there last time Jesus did it and obviously um, Pepe scored that run of his was terrific I mean the timing of it was terrific I mean his the finish wasn't terrific he kind of bundled it <laughs> into the goal but the run itself he did was what he phenomenal. needed to get it done yeah it went it, how, how it looked doesn't show up on the score sheet right no. so uh-uh. um you know serviceable job as a wing not his real position eventually he's going to be competing as the nine right so um it worked not a deal but it's okay yeah you know it is continuously the most frustrating thing about this team is this this club's inability to get somebody to consistently play that left wing attacking position i know fafa pico is here to do that but i when fafa plays it is so clear the advantages of having somebody that plays that position naturally versus this weird carousel of people they keep trying to dump into that place that aren't naturally suited for that and the differences in the performances you get from those guys. Yeah, the only other real wing I think that they have is um, Emma Tuomasi, who, of course, is not here. So um, there's no there's, – there's no, Fafa clearly is different and clearly makes it work. If he can stay healthy, that's the obvious answer for that position. Yeah, well, you know, they do have Santiago Mascara, who mysteriously oh, made God. an appearance last night. Like, I, th- I thought he was uh, – I swear I saw an official sheet that said he was out. No, he was out on the MLS injury report, and he was out on the FC Dallas media notes. The only place he wasn't listed out was FC Dallas's little story they do, their little game day, but Garrett does it, their little game day thing. He was not listed out there. But the two other official places he was listed out, and I think, if I remember correctly, Dan, didn't – after the game, didn't – um, Lucy mentioned that, that Santi had come back from injury. So I, I think there was something going on, but honestly, this 10 minutes, that's it. That's what he gets the 10 to 15 minutes. That's all he's good uh, for. That's all he can do. He's the that's, last five, that's, 10 yeah. impact guy. Yeah, that's it. That's all you're going to get. I, I don't, but he's not even, I, look, I know he scored last night and it was literally from six inches, but a goal is a goal, but he, he really was pretty much worthless. But again, I mean, was did he do anything of value in the in the time he was on the field yesterday? Other than, yes, score the goal. But there was somebody right next to him who would have tap, tapped it in themselves. Steal Hara's goal. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, steal Hara's goal. Well, the one thing I would say in his favor is that, and I know Dallas at that point was pressing the game, but you know, eighty percent of his action is up in the final third, at least. You know, so there is that. I mean. 
And look, you, sometimes you have to look at things with a, with a, with a sunk costs in mind. And the sunk cost in his case is the contract. Yeah. You're, you're, okay. And it's okay. fact, he can't go 90 minutes. So throw the nut, throw that out for now. You're stuck with him. How can we use him? I've 10 minutes it. at the end of a game. He had go one ahead. other thing he did. Uh, mm. That shot in injury time where he tried to curl it around the keeper. Keeper had no chance of getting it. And uh, the sub, uh, Dibasi, uh, almost scored an own goal off it. All right. Well, good for there him. You go. There you go. He did something. He did. All right. And I'm sure pod listeners are like, God, you guys are wasting time talking about mascara. All we want to hear is buzzes. <laughs> <laughs> Cobra news. We'll get to that in just a second. I do. I do want to mention. I was the other exciting thing last night was obviously Dante Seeley's uh, debut or at least appearance on the team. Uh, man, watching the young kid go at defenders, take defenders. He there were two very clear moments where he should have gotten calls that he didn't. The foul at the top of the box when the defender stepped in front of him after he pushed the ball past him, and what should have been, I think, at least looked at by VAR. If it wasn't, was the uh, the ball played to him? I think from Barrios deep in the box where he got shoved over uh, that yeah. went out for a goal kick. He, the kid has got a little bit of something. Well, I I don't want to sound completely cliched here, and I'm gonna try not to because we've been watching Dante Sealy very closely for a couple of years now. The kid is an amazing, amazing athlete, really fast. I know it sounds like a cliche, and but phenomenally skilled on the ball, amazing ball skill. He will go at not just one defender, but two or three defenders all the time with no fear at all. I mean, MLS defenders in training, he does not give a crap. He will try anything. Now, the problem is, is that tactically he's incredibly naive in the sense that he doesn't know when to do it. He doesn't, his, his, his choice of moments. Now this, I'm talking about a complete game now, not, 10 minutes at the end, which is where he's wonderful in this scenario. Go, 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 go. That's fine. But like in a complete tactical game, you have to play within a team concept and you have to play within appropriate times of the game. Now, if you, if you doubt me on this, look back at his record with North Texas last year and his inability to lock down a starting job, even with North Texas to even be consistently called off the bench with North Texas. He didn't even play like at all in the playoffs for them. So yes, humongous upside the kid's going to be worth at some point in his career i think gobs and gobs of money and he may hardly ever play for fc dallas very much but you know beyond like a five minute thing right now he's not even remotely close to being able to play a real mls game this this kid is desperately in need of more time at north texas and right now he can't get it because of the covid going back and forth between yeah. rosters. Well, presuma- presumably he, we know that you can go back and forth if you have antibodies. The fact that he hasn't gone back and forth tells me that he doesn't. So, I mean, that's <laughs> what we know. you say it that way, it makes it sound like he, he didn't go to the store and buy yeah. something. <laughs> he didn't get his shots. Right. Basically, that's it, right? It's like he, and there's a couple other guys on FC Dallas, Nikosi Burgess, uh, Eddie Manjoma, who are desperate for desperate for playing time in North Texas and they can't get it. You know, so but Seeley has earned this chance on the bench when they were missing six players and great, amazing, awesome that he got the minutes. And yes, humongous future. Just don't expect it to be any time in the next year. It's going to be, think back to Paxton taking three years, Jesus taking three years. This kid's going to need some time, but, you know, and it may come somewhere else eventually because he's going to be worth a lot of money somewhere to somebody. Last, and I don't, and I, and I didn't mean to say this for last, but I, I think I'm okay in saying I actually was kind of impressed with Zobek last night. I after a little bit of a shaky start uh, and the weird kind of way he got uh, nutmegged for the opening goal, I, I didn't think he performed badly last night. And man, he's super verbose and in, in communicating with his back line. Yeah, communication is one of his strong points. He's particularly good at that. Um, you know, for me. Uh, he has moments where he rises to the occasions, and I think this was one. But he also has moments of letdown, which was the first early goal. Now, quick, quick in, at your feet sort of reaction saves is probably one of his weakest spots. He had a couple later going on, but that is his weak spot. That and lateral, like post to post quickness, like pure shot stopper, good game reading, pretty good communication, amazing, sh- sh- pure shot stopping power, good lateral quickness, not so great. 
quick reaction is not so great. So you see that when he played and then he rises to the occasion. The question is how much confidence would you have him in him like day to day to day to day? He, there's a, there's a reason why he's been the third keeper here for forever. Not, you know, since he's been back and you haven't ever seen him play before. Right. I mean, it's not coincidence. So, I mean, he had, a, he had an okay game. Not great. I don't think it was great. And so what's the uh, latest status update of, is it Philippe or Felipe or the new Brazilian uh, goalkeeper? Yes, he's out of quarantine on the 15th, I think, which is the day before the um, Rapids Colorado. game. Yeah, next week. Okay. All right, anything before we get into the good stuff everybody's been waiting for? Dan, anything else you want to throw out there about uh, the 2-3 to three loss against Minnesota? I mean, it's over. That's good. <laughs> I want to talk about Brian Reynolds. Deep. Okay. We talk did about skip Brian. over Brian Reynolds, didn't we? We yeah. did. Sorry. Well, I got into Pepe and I forgot about Brian. Yeah, talk about Brian. Yeah. Well, I thought he was terrific, actually. Um, you saw from him, and if you look at the passing chart, I can't show you on a podcast, you'll see that he has a boatload of activity in the final third compared to Nelson having none. So uh, we love Johnny, defensively speaking, but we've talked for weeks now about the missing part of his game. Brian clearly had that. His chart is full, complete, end-to-end, tons of activity in the offensive end, just like Reggie used to have, right? So granted, not all of his crosses connected, but he did have one that was a goal. He had another one that Barrios pinged off the crossbar. He helped her set up the uh, draw that corner kick that led to the other Dallas goal. Plus, when he did make a defensive error, you can see that he has the pace to recover. He can catch almost anybody and get back in position. And that's the modern end-to-end attacking outside back that Lucci actually needs for Lucci ball to happen. So you can see why we've been saying that Reynolds is Cannon's replacement, that Hollingshead will be back on the left, and that's what you're going to have. No offense to Johnny Nelson, but it's been a problem for two weeks now, three weeks now since Cannon was out of the game, since Ryan came back. So... I thought Rant Reynolds was great. I think it's clear he's going to – I'd be stunned if he doesn't start from here on out, basically. Well, that certainly would be refreshing, to, to, considering Reggie's now gone. Uh, and we'll talk – let's put a pen in Reggie because we'll talk about that here in a little bit. So uh, the lineup comes out yesterday afternoon, about an hour before the game, and I noticed uh, that in the notes it's uh, – well, I first noticed that Cobra was – you know, first after getting over the fact that Ryan was starting at center back, middle center back, uh, <laughs> I noticed that Cobra wasn't in the, uh, is it the 20, I guess, officially for these games? They get to 20, yeah. Bring, yeah, 20. And I thought that, and it said personal reasons. And that immediately raised all kinds of red flags with me. Uh, and I even tweeted something immediately because, you know, it would seem very reactionary uh, to think other, that, that, that there isn't something really horrible going on and, and not to think the worst. But with this club in particular, it's not unfair based on its history to think something else is going on. And Buzz, apparently there is something going on with Mr. Cobra. Yeah, I, this is a good opportunity, I think, to talk a little bit about how this process works for us. So um, I'm going to go through a couple of steps that back up 100% what you just said. So the first is that having been around sports television for a long time, I can tell you, and this is true in the NBA, it's true covering soccer, and I know you know this is true, Peter, that when a team spokesman talks about a player's availability, whether it be injury or whether it be personal reasons or whether it be where they are, they're almost always lying through their teeth. And if they aren't lying completely, then they're probably not telling you the whole story. And I'll give you some FC doubt. I mean, you can use the hockey lower body injury. You can use football scenarios where they talk about a guy's got eyes, got a little bit of knock, and then he's on IR for six months. So uh, I can give you two specific examples of this. For weeks now, Paxton's been saying he's fine. Right, and then I reported that he was well, going to need hell, surgery. I would, I, well, hold on a second. You could take yeah. you could take the Paxton story back to last year. Sure. Yes. And like, and I, even I reported that he was going to have surgery and when she was, Oh, well, maybe that's on the table. No, he's having surgery. And then I'll give you another example. Last year, not last year, 2018, end of 2018, Oscar Pereja was missing for two days. And I asked a team spokesperson where he was. The and coach they said, was missing for two the days. The coach was missing for two days. <laughs> this was after the team had been eliminated, mind you. I asked the team spokesperson where he was and they said he's, he and his son, Diego are visiting colleges. Okay, great. Oscar comes back. Oscar, how was your weekend trip visiting colleges with Diego? He looked at me like I was batshit insane, like I was crazy. The next day, he resigns and he's going to 
Tijuana. So, right, there's no way. He wasn't with colleges. He was in Tijuana. Right. So, again, teams lie through their teeth about availability. So, the minute you see a player say, as you just said, personal reasons, family stuff, whatever, we immediately assume they're lying and we start asking questions. Now, let me back up a little bit. Coming out of the Florida COVID situation, Camp COVID, right, we know what kind of personality Cobra has. We know what he's like. He's gregarious. He's a boisterous. Everybody loves him. He's life at the party, right? Those guys were locked in rooms for 14 days, and I guarantee you that was hard on Cobra. In fact, coming out of there, I had three different people, three different sources tell me Cobra is tired, Cobra is burnt, Cobra is thinking about going home. Okay. Now I didn't report anything on it because it's just what I call chatter in this circumstance. I couldn't report anything because it wasn't actionable. It's just vibe I'm getting is that man Cobra is really in the dumps. Now this is occurring at the exact same time that Frank O'Hara has showed up and Haro has taken the starting position away from Cobra. And we all think not on merits of play, right? To us, it looks like Hara's playing because he's getting paid a million dollars. The Cobra didn't lose his job. Now, a little while ago, Cobra had a little bit of a knock and he missed a couple of weeks of training. So now now that's Lucci's word of mouth is that, oh, he's trying to get his form back and get his groove back. He was coming back in and competing, blah, blah, blah. Okay, sure. So when all of a sudden you see this personal... So I already have these red flags, right? I already have these, oh man, I got to keep an eye on Cobra. And then you have the, again, personal business, family issue. He doesn't travel when he's healthy. Okay, that's not good. So I started checking, and here's what I have. Uh, I have confirmed that, yes, indeed, there is something personal. And that, yes, he is going to go home. He has not left yet. He's leaving this weekend is what I'm told. So whatever it is, is bad enough that he feels he needs to leave the country And as Lucci said today on the conference call, they're worried about him mentally because of what this is. And Lucci even hinted that they don't know when he's going to come back. And I'm going to go even further. I'm going to say, based on what I was already hearing, that COVID already was thinking about leaving. And then now you combine this personal thing. I think you just called him COVID. COVID, did I? (laughs) Cobra (laughs) in the COVID times because of COVID, because of the shutdown, because of Hara, because he was already feeling down, right? Now you add this fourth factor in and he's going to, enough that he's going to go home. I think that there's a very, very good chance that he never comes back, that he does a Ned Yalkov and we don't see him again. That's what I think is going to happen. Okay, this all has a weird combination. This feels like a little bit of Anton Yedyalkov and a little bit of Kellen Acosta. A little bit, yes. It's it's a comp. Like I would have compared Acosta as the perfect analogy, and then you add on now the personal something like Ned Yalkov had. I don't know if it's the same thing or not, but you know, there's obviously a confluence of things that are weighing very, very heavily on a player, so much so that he's leaving the country. And that's the kind of thing that makes a, what is Cobra, 29? That makes a 29, maybe 30 now, makes a 30-year-old really consider their future. Where do I want to play when I have two, maybe three years left? You know what I mean? So, you know, he's for sure leaving the country. The team has no idea when he's going to be back. And I think it's a very, very good chance to say 80, 90% that he's never coming back. Okay, well, let me let me posit this question to you. If Cobra, up until this point, had been the regular starting number nine for this team, he was playing in front of Hara, he was getting 79, 75, 90 minutes a game, scoring goals, does he still go home this weekend? Yeah, I think he does. I, I think this is a big enough personal issue that he still goes home this weekend. You know, mm-hmm. it, it's hard to say because I can't speak for him because he is a guy that lives off of his personality. You know, so if he'd been in the lineup coming out of COVID, the COVID lockdown, if he'd have been in the lineup every single game and scoring, maybe he would feel so good this wouldn't have happened. He wouldn't be going. But uh, I, I don't, that's almost impossible for me to really predict. I, I think that it wouldn't, that from what I understand, this is a big enough deal that he would be going no matter what. All right, Dan, uh, you've uh, been sitting by patiently and quiet. Do you have anything you want to throw in here about the Cobra situation? 
I mean, we can certainly speculate on some things. Uh, Ooh, I love to speculate. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, you know, if he is going out of town uh, for a personal reason, he's got family from the Czech Republic. He has a, a fiancé in Poland, depending on which one he goes to, kind of uh, dictates how personal Wait, is personal. He's got more than one fiancé? No, he's Czech. She's Polish. Oh, you said depending on which one he goes. He oh, I like family I, or fiance, oh, like how thought, personal issues. I thought maybe I figured out something cool about Cobra. <laughs> yeah, he's he's a straight up polygamist. This is great. Um, he's a real what? snake. Well, I don't know. He's I getting know transferred to Rail Salt Lake any day now. <laughs> I didn't know what happens in the Czech Republic. You know, maybe they live life differently than we do here in the United States. They do. They speak Czech. Oh, okay, awesome. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but the other thing I, I do have a question though, and 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 certainly we can all buy into the fact that he's got something going on in his personal life, and I don't know what that is, and, and we can speculate more. But the one piece of speculation I do want to throw in here, Dan, because I think this will help with what you're fleshing out, is how much of this has to do with the fact that he had achieved a spot on the national team last year and had a little bit of success with them. Now he's not starting and playing regularly for Dallas. And is and he didn't get called up to the national team for their Nations League stuff, where they even had to go and get an entire second team due to a COVID breakout, and he still didn't get a call up. And I'm just wondering, is there something else going on in his mind where he's thinking, maybe I need to be closer to the national team if I want to get my spot back? I mean, it's, it's wholly possible. He, he hasn't lost any spot, though. They couldn't have called him. They, that's why when the why US... Why couldn't they have called him? Because we're in the middle of a pandemic, travel ex- with travel restrictions. Same way, um, the US when they fulfill their next fixtures, the the squad's going to be made up entirely of European based players. Uh, well, then how is he getting to go back to Czech Republic for a family issue? Well, there's certainly some restrictions, but he, you know, quarantine doesn't doesn't uh, f- you know kind of get in the way of that. It does when you're trying to play soccer against teams. Hmm. All right. I thought for sure that if you had the right reasons, you could travel overseas uh, for work stuff. But all right, maybe I'm wrong about that. But, Go uh, keep going. Yeah, Sorry. No, no, I was going to say, uh, the other thing I was going to say is, you know, we're in this wonderful age of social media. Uh, def- I mean, depends on your definition of wonderful. And Cobra and his fiance are very, 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 very public in their, in their affection. <laughs> which uh, which apparently hasn't been the case for the past nine days. So, you know. Uh, you don't it, mean like sex tape or anything, right? I, I, I don't want to see his Cobra. Okay, all right. Um, no, but I mean, you know, there's a lot of like, uh, you know, his, his fiance came out with him and um, contrary to the popular belief, uh, us Europeans without a visa, we can't just stay here forever. So, uh, does she is she does she live here in in the Dallas area with him? No, she she can't. Um, so she can stay for like a maximum of three months and has to go back, which uh, is what happened in March. She had to go back. COVID kicks in, so they've been separated for quite a while. So. You know, it could be there could be an element of the Ned Yalkov thing where his girlfriend couldn't get a visa, so suddenly he got homesick. Uh, it, it could be something. It could be a breakup, for all we know, since there's been like this uh, supposed stop in in uh, you know being all uh, sickly in love on social media. I guess we're just gonna have to sit back and watch. All right, so Buzz, I'm going to ask you uh, a tough uh, roster tactical question because, as you know, I have grown to appreciate Cobra more for his infectious personality and his passion and kind of the energy he brings on the field, which I really, really love. I'm still not convinced he's a very good soccer player in general, at least not an MLS-level starting striker, which is really what this team needs. Um, and, And so I do wonder if, in fact cobra leaves how much what really is the team missing or losing in that scenario well i think you nailed it it's his um mentality and missing his infectiousness his grind you know he, he he does not ever give up there's a there's a i think there's a big value to that particularly late in games um you know, or, or even on the road sometimes, you know, early in games when you're just, you're flat because you traveled or whatever, 
the team the, the, the look, he's still the leading scorer on this team. And he only played like two games. <laughs> right? Yeah. From back in March. <laughs> but doesn't that say more about the team than yeah. it does him personally? <laughs> Well, no, I, I know. I'm not saying that he's God's gift to the, I mean, what a change this is from a year ago, right? I'm not saying he's God's gift to FC Dallas and that he's the answer to all their prayers. But think about the game that he started recently, the one he got when Hara was missing because of the birth of his kid. That was the same game Fafa Pico was around, if I remember correctly. And they won, right? They were yeah. better. So, you know, the team, I think, plays better with Cobra. Can they learn to play better with Hara? I mean, sure, coach him up, right? But right now, I think Cobra, the way Cobra plays is affectionous and infectious into the whole team. And he also had figured out late last year and early this year, one of the things he figured out and got playing time for was his ability to make those quick checkbacks and layoffs that were freeing Barrios and were freeing people on the other side. So, you know, that's not happening right now with Hara. It happened with Ricarte. When Ricarte came in, he knew he did it. So right now, there's definitely a little bit of a disconnect, and I think he would be a better answer than Frank O'Hara. The question will be long-term, is that true or not? And we're going to find out because the team has no idea when Cobra's coming back, if he ever does, and so it's horror for now. Yeah, yeah I'm just telling you guys he's not coming back. Well, Yeah, I agree with you. I don't think he's going to be back either. <laughs> I mean, that was, yeah. that was something that Lucci said earlier today. Uh, when in the in the Zoom said, I'm not sure if we will see him soon or even again, and that's the reality of the situation. Okay. All right, yeah. And if when a coach says that, it's all but certain the dude's not coming yeah. back. Minus the only situation, the only way I see him coming back is if somewhere in the next few weeks, Hara suffers some sort of season-ending injury and he suddenly <laughs> becomes the available number one. Well, right? the important the important things I think were to get out the information that a he was already struggling. Right, that I'm here, that I was hearing yeah. and getting from people, and that a, B, that a hundred percent legit family problem, and he is a hundred percent legit leaving. So when we add all these, there's like five pieces now that make us think like, man, any one of those things was enough to want you to where you might think about leaving. You add all five of them up, and he's gone. Yeah, but to just summarize, the his struggling up to this point had nothing to do with whatever this personal injury, is, personal situation is, and everything to do with his status in the team. Correct. And his uh, form. Well, that and the the uh, the lockdown. The what the problems started occurring. To, the, the information started coming to me post COVID lockdown, which is the same time that Frank O'Hara arrived. So, mm -hmm. you know, you can. I, I was not told specifically that Hara is a problem. We just think that Hara is a problem in the sense that Cobra lost his job for a non-playing reason. Look, right. we've said this before. Players are not stupid they can tell in training if a dude is better or not. And I, I guarantee you, you watch the game, you cannot tell me right now that Frank O'Hara is better than Cobra. So that's part of it. You know, it's not fair in his mind, probably. No, I, yeah. I mean, I haven't seen anything in particular. Uh, yeah, no, I completely yeah. agree with you. I, neither one of them have proven to me to be fantastic finishers. One works a lot harder than the other. And the one that doesn't work as hard as the other is clearly a tactically smarter soccer player. He just isn't super fast and it doesn't appear to be able to get away from people. Yeah. Well, whether they're both, the answer is not the question. The question is compared to each other. And this is what's tough for Lucci now too. Everybody loves Cobra. In the and locker I don't room. think in the locker room and in the and, fan base. And, and, and I don't room. think everybody loves Hara. I don't think that's the happening. I think Hara's got big time disease. Well, no, but I, uh, to, uh, and just to pull the curtain back a little bit, I think it's pretty fair to say that Mikey Barrios isn't the most loved dude in the locker room. No, but you see Barrios um, in social media with other guys. Like he's got a little group that he hangs with, you know? So mm -hmm. you see some interact. Like he doesn't, he's not super mega social like Barrios. Like, sorry, like Cobra is. Barrios isn't. He's kind of a quiet dude. That's okay. You can be quiet. There's a difference between being quiet and being Mr. Big Time, right? If you're going right. to you're gonna big league everybody, uh, we, don't, we don't got time for that, dude. You got to come in here and work for us. All so, right. Good All for right. Lucci. I, good luck. 
<laughs> and while we're we're making assumptions that we've we're never seeing the cobra again, uh, I, I do want to flesh that out to one more degree. If in fact that is the case, and he and his contract is dropped, and he's not with the club, what does that mean in terms of the roster spot, the money, and the implications against the salary cap for the rest of the season? Do the Hunts have an opportunity to fill that, considering the window is still open? Uh. Well, I'd have to look and see what the math is um, on an open position. Um, if you put him on IR, I don't think you can do anything just with that. They already have a Rongis who's already getting some roster relief. So short of cutting him, which you could do, but I don't think they're going to want to do that. I don't think they'll cut him, Cobra, just to do that. I think they'll wait and see if he comes back. I mean, technically right now, they have one open roster position. They already do. If you don't count the emergency keeper, which doesn't count, there's an open roster spot. So you could make a move in this window if you have cap money. I don't, I don't know. And who knows about that? Yeah. But, I just, I wonder if uh, Zanata has anybody up his sleeve that he's going, Oh wait, here's an opportunity. I mean, maybe we can bring this guy in. I was well, going to wait till next season to do it. I bet they got caught off guard by this. I don't think Cobra would have warned them that all of a sudden he's gone. Right. I mean, I don't, I doubt it. So it'll, it'll, it'll be interesting to see if in this, I mean, the window's not closed, so there's plenty of time, you know, and, and hopefully this staff has done its due diligence in looking for other positions just in case. I mean, you should be doing that, not just for keeper and not just for striker, you know, everywhere you should be doing that. So um, there is some time. Maybe we'll see some activity because they do have a spot. There is an available spot. So. All right. Well, that's some uh, weird drama. I, 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 does this qualify as another entry into the uh, the, oh, the yeah. list of stuff? That, oh, for, the... for sure. Yeah, 100%. Right. Yeah. I have one more person uh, reading through it before we publish it. Okay. Um, so that does now get added to the annual weird list of stuff that's yeah. to happened to this club. <laughs> yeah, hey, no, for sure. Yeah. All right. Now, uh, Dan, because you are our resident worldly guy from another place, not from here, and you've been exposed to all of this global football, I'm going to run this by you. Am I correct in saying that FC Dallas leads the world globally in farewell videos yes there is absolutely no doubt about that fc dallas are the only team in the world that puts more emphasis on who's leaving than who's coming in so this week we got another entry into the hall of fame of fc dallas farewell videos as the deal for reggie cannon to boa vista was completed and we even in, in the same day not only did we get the amazing hey guys thanks for all your love and support going away video we also got a rather amazing hey i'm reggie cannon i'm so glad to be at Bo boa vista video which in itself was equally impressive yeah there's some quality production going on in the social media ballparks of both these teams now one of the things that comes out about this that I am somewhat surprised by, maybe I shouldn't be, is this kind of um, repeating uh, reaction online of people who seem surprised that he ended up at Boa Vista in the Portuguese league and not at like Bayern Munich or Man City or Arsenal or something. I, is that just a naivety of the general fan base or am I... Am, am I Am I undergrading Reggie's uh, abilities by being happy for him to land at Boa Vista? Well, I think it's two pronged. Um, number one, it's the the lack of recognition that there's a difference between Reggie Cannon, Cannon and Alfonso Davies. That there's a there's a difference in those two players, and that you think that oh, Alfonso Davies can go to Bayern Munich, then Reggie can go to Bayern Munich or something similar, and that's simply not true. Um, Wait, now, I just want to I want to make sure yeah. that we say something very clearly. I love Reggie Cannon, and I think yeah. very highly of him, but he's nowhere near Alfonso Davies no. on the global scale. No, and if you think that he is, then you're crazy. Now, we all love Reggie. The kid is phenomenal. He's an amazing kid. He's a super smart kid. We want the best for him. Now, the other half of, the under, of, of why isn't he going to Bayern Munich story is the fact that if you don't follow us specifically – then you won't know the Leal story. You won't know the other half of this move. This move isn't Reggie going to Boa Vista. This move is Reggie going to Leal with a 
short stop along the way because Leal has a $13 million right back they haven't sold yet. They're stashing him, same owner of the two clubs. And matter of fact, like when the, when this first deal first came up, all my information was about the French team, about Lille. Bola Vista came in much later. Originally, they were even talking about sending him to a different country entirely. It's just that this is how the thing got worked out. Now, could it fall apart and Reggie never ends up at Lille? Sure, if he stinks for the next year or two, then it won't happen that way. But I guarantee you, because this move, based on the numbers that are being reported, are double Bola Vista's previous sale a buy price for anybody ever. Well, that's not a coincidence. It's because this bigger, huge club is involved and it's underlying basically the whole thing. So maybe you feel better about this whole scenario if you think of it as Reggie's going to Lille with a pit stop along the way, not Reggie's going to Boa Vista. Does right, that make Dan, sense? Yeah, no, it totally does. And Dan, do we know for sure? Because I think I read earlier today that the guy that owns Lille or the ownership group of Lille does not yet own Boa Vista, but are in the process of buying it. Do you know the answer to that? Uh, all the talk was back in July that it was it was all but done. Okay. Uh, Maybe it is. I thought I'd read today I mean, that I they think, were still in that process. Yeah, but they've I, been loaning players from Lille to Boa Vista as well, too. There's clearly a connection between the two clubs. Yeah, I think just buying that control and interest was kind of an, an aside to the, the goodwill relation that they have anyway. You know, um, Especially with different uh, residency rules in Europe, it's, it's commonplace. You know, how... Man United used to have that uh, relationship with Royal Antwerp, and you know all sorts of teams would stash talent away, let them get their residency quicker in a certain country, or or just let them get experience while they're, you know, while they've got a player waiting in the wings. So, yeah, yeah. and and I and I know for anybody who's disappointed, uh, and you really shouldn't be. Let me. I think all three of us should take a moment to tell anybody who's disappointed he ended up at Boa Vista and not at, you know, Schalke or, or, uh, or Brentford for that matter. That this actually plays really well for Reggie because it gives him an opportunity to play in a league that is probably equitable to the to Major League Soccer in terms of overall skill level and performance. I know somebody's going to send me an email telling me I'm out of my mind. Um, and But also tamp down expectations and give him an opportunity to experience living somewhere other than here, Dallas, Texas, for the first time. Uh, without the pressure of being in the Bundesliga or the Premier League, or for that matter, the championship, right? Uh, we're right about that, right? Yeah, no, 100%. This is a way to go over there and get comfortable and get settled in dealing in a completely alien environment um, at a league that is it is comparable 100%. This player is worth more than anybody they've ever had before on that club, pretty much, what they paid for him and what they're going to pay him. So, um, you know, and a right back even. So it's like, it's, it's a stepping stone. This is not, you know, it's just one little first part and it's a part that is actually really perfect for him, I think, in terms of his progression. Yeah. I mean, even just, you know, people saying, oh, Boa Vista, who's that? Well, you know, it's, it. you know, if you look at Portugal, you've got three main teams. You've got Sporting, Lisbon, Benfica, Porto. There are four teams since the Second World War that have won the league and Boa Vista is one of those four. They have been a Champions League semi-finalist. It is a close, hostile environment. It's all the things that you want to play uh, come into Europe to to experience, to get them ready. And oh, all man. the expectation, the media speculation. Because if you think, uh, and if anyone thinks that us us on a Zoom call, to you know, sort of patting Reggie on the back for for things um, that we feel like he's right about. That's not the kind of intensity that he's gonna get any in any country in Europe. So letting him go to somewhere like Portugal, where he's not in the spotlight of that top three, but you know he's in that chasing pack of three or four next bigger clubs, uh, particularly with an intense rivalry with Porto, who are what ten minutes drive away across the city. Uh, you know this is this is an ideal place for him. Yes, and I would also say that uh, damn you, COVID and travel restrictions, because once I saw the Boa Vista Stadium, 
there was a immediate bullet up my list of travel destination de- destinations <laughs> to go see a game because that place looks kick ass. It is the de- the definition of a shoebox stadium. Yeah, the fans are right on top of the field there. It's going to be something else. Yeah, that would be a great. We should all figure out a way next year, if possible, to go. That together. is actually that w- the stadium that every Luton Town fan has fantasized about for the last twenty years. Well, for the last uh, whenever they. Yeah, 2004, so nearly 20 years. Yeah, that oh, that is such a cool... If you haven't seen it, uh, do a Google search for the Boa Vista Stadium, and you'll, you'll figure it out pretty quickly. Well, you can well, watch it in that video they put out uh, introducing Reggie. He's, he's in the stadium. It's not lit up, but you can see yeah, it. You, uh, yeah, but there's some better pictures of you get a real sense of the tightness and scale of the stadium because it's not a big stadium. I, what does it hold? 25,000, 30,000? I think it's even. Oh, I have no idea. (laughs) Yeah, it's not a big. It it just the way that the stands are set up. Everybody is. It's super steep angles. It's almost like standing room only style, except it's not. But it's super steep. Yeah, it reminds me of Boca with the vertical. Yeah, and very very vertical angles, uh, and and it's on all four sides, just squished together like a shoebox. Um, it, it's uh, pretty, inti- it's a very intimidating looking place. Now there's a whole other part that we got into at the beginning about this with Reggie and farewell videos and, and the oddity, uh, about that with FC Dallas that I want to, I want to save for a future conversation because it really, I had this whole epiphany when the Reggie video came out today or yesterday, uh, that will you guys, uh, uh, uh put up with me and having that conversation somewhere down the road? Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. Okay. It'd be an honor. <laughs> well now i'm now i've overhyped it it's gonna be a total yeah. sucky conversation we'll get to it okay uh moving on to other things uh the other thing that happened this week that i thought was interesting and buzz i think you can help uh flesh out a little bit that you did not have in the show notes that i remembered was the league's announcement of mls next what yeah. in the world is this zoomer looking thing well, that's their uh, super hype, uh, ultra hip stir name for the academy. I mean, I don't know why they couldn't just call it the MLS Academy, but it's it's what they're calling their academy league because their their uh, angle is the who's next, you know, pathway. So they created a bunch of cool uh, multimedia ways for kids to make themselves a picture of themselves with the logo and make a splashy kind of announcement for the kids. They didn't bother to put up the schedule past the first weekend or rosters either one but they've got the cool pictures ready so that's fun yeah i was able to put my picture the picture of my dog on a on a player profile (laughs) thing so don't talk bad about it (laughs) yeah that's okay that's cool i mean the kids love it you know yeah i'm sure they do and the other thing that's interesting about it is this is that there are non-mls clubs in this lineup like solar is in it right yeah a bunch of them yeah, nationally. they opened it up. Yeah, they they opened it up nationally to basically anyone that was in the academy, essentially that could apply. And there was a bunch of teams that got in right away. There was a bunch of teams that got in the second round. And they in the in the bylaws which I have, they talk about um, once a year they'll they they basically open it up to anyone and they'll review and they'll add on. So they they they're one hundred percent behind the idea of getting more and more teams in it because uh, in order to try and keep expenses down, they're mostly going to play regional. Like you'll be in a conference for like the Texas one will be obvious, you know? So, okay. um, it's, it's, it's basically the same as the Academy. There, there are some tiny little differences in terms of some of the the rules and, and the, who the, and, and who's out of it are different. Texans chose not to go in to their detriment, I believe, but solar's in, which is great. That's a good club. I'm happy to have them in. Okay, so that's a good that's a good uh, segue to the next question. Is is with anything that comes with MLS comes controversy and criticism and reasons why it's a bad thing. What are the knocks against MLS's next? Uh, I guess or MLS not next, not is yeah. next. Yeah. <laughs> well, not everybody's in it, I guess. So, so that I mean, some of the DA clubs didn't come in. the The big complaint from some kids is that you still can't play high school ball. Or middle school ball, <laughs> which is interesting. Um, so, because some kids like to do that, but for me, like the guys that are the for sure pros, they don't care about the high school stuff so much. Um, they did open up to where you can recruit in other people's territories. Like there is no territory rules uh, for the MLS Next League. Uh, so it's important to understand that that is not the same as the MLS homegrown signing territory rule. 
This is different. This is, but you can recruit from somebody's backyard. So like Dallas could go down and pluck a kid right out of Houston, even out of their academy. If you want, you have to get their permission to steal it from their academy, but you can get a kid out of their backyard and have them come up here and play for you. It's no big deal. So I'm a, I'm an up and coming U11 here in Dallas. What you're saying to me is NYCFC could scout me and take me over to play in their academy team but I could become a star for the NYC. I'm just fantasizing here. NYCFC youth team or academy team. But when it came time to sign a deal with NYCFC, the MLS team, that's where all of that becomes an issue. Yeah, unless they change the homegrown rule, which we think they will eventually. Right now, as far as we know, they have not. So right now, no, you still have the Chris Capas rule. You still can't sign a guy from the other team's homegrown territory. So in, in my scenario, uh, NYCFC would have to give something to Dallas for my homegrown rights. Yes. For me yeah. to do that. Okay. Yes. Yeah. But up until that point, it's free game. Yeah, you can play wherever you want to. You know, so some of the academies that have really good reputations and for good coaching and good environments may overload and end up with a whole bunch of really talented kids, hypothetically. Man, that's going to make some really weird, hard times for some kids because some kid's going to get recruited to go play at a club and grow up through that team's academy system. And when it comes time to sign an MLS deal, he may have to choose like Chris Kappas did. He's going to have to. Yeah. He's going to have. It's it's the Chris Kappas, like you just said. Yeah. It's the Chris Kappas rule all over again. Blaine Ferry, same boat. Yeah. You know, that's unfortunate. Uh, Jonathan, Go- uh, Jonathan uh, Gomez at uh, Lou City, our former academy player here. Same boat. Right. Yep. I Probably just all... appreciate Buzz, uh, uh, sorry, Peter accidentally saying kiss crappies. I did say kiss <laughs> crappies, didn't I? Oh, yeah. Well, there's yeah. a fun story of that poor kid having his passport taken by the government because the club forgot to fill out the paperwork for his work permit. Yeah, I saw something online. So what happened to poor Chris Kappas? Yeah, the club forgot to fill in the paperwork wait, wait, to get well, his... Look, you got to tell everybody club. what club he's with. Hobro. Hobro in... Uh, God, is that Finland, Dan? No, it's Sweden, isn't it? Sweden? Okay, Hobro. Yeah. They is forgot to fill. I mean, I don't like remember no. what country it is. I, I thought Hobro care. was Swedish. Anyway, tell the story. It doesn't matter. It. What matters is, is the club forgot to fill in the paperwork to extend his work permit. And so when they didn't do that, the police oh, yeah. or not the, the immigration authorities basically contacted Chris and said, you don't have a work permit. We're coming to your house and taking your passport. So they did. They showed up at his house and took his passport. And he's basically stuck. He can't train for the team. He can't play for the team. He wants to leave, and they're refusing to sell him. Uh, and he, can, he doesn't have a passport, and he has to go to an appeal scenario get, to get to be able to stay in the country or whatever. So, well, it, And he can't well, leave the country without his passport either. Basically. I mean, he's basically waiting to either be kicked out of the country, I assume, back to the U.S., or – or the order to get the appeal to get the work permit renewed so that then he can train and, or they will sell him. So <laughs> it's a, it's a, the poor kid. Yeah. Well, a uh, point to Dan, it is Denmark. It's the first division of Denmark. I got that. I get to down. keep my EU citizenship. Screw you, Brexit. <laughs> <laughs> so is there any chance he comes back and plays in major league soccer? I mean, I think that Dallas uh, would like to bring him back at some point. I don't think it's high on the radar, but the kid's got serious game. I mean, there's no room in the midfield right now anyway. So yeah. short-term, no. I mean, there, I understand from some people I've talked to that there are some big clubs eyeing him, some German clubs. Now, what means big, I don't know. I mean, not bigger than Hobro. You know, somebody nice that would be good to move to hopefully and and i think in the long run it'll get worked out you know he's their best player by far and he'll be worth something to them if they can sell him so i think they'll get it done eventually either way he's worth a place on the discovery list oh my god they better have done that right away i'm I'm assuming they did a long time ago you'd hope i would have thought like the minute he signs the homegrown rule goes out the window the territory rule goes out the window so now you can get him by discovery you know Okay, uh, we'll preview the Houston game and uh, here in just a second before we wrap things up. But, uh, Buzz, you did want to run through a few notes on North Texas, including uh, an improving Thomas Roberts, who actually was in the uh, 20 in Minnesota for the senior team last night. Yeah, Thomas isn't playing great. I'll try and do this really quickly. The, the, the thing I want to talk about with Thomas is that he has actually signed with uh, and is working with an outside strength and conditioning group called Athlete Performance Network, APN. Now, the reason that's interesting, because it says something about Thomas. Number one, he's been dealing with a little bit of like 
uh, and tiny little injury kind of stuff, as all players do. And he wants to get that cleaned up. He wants to work on his strength and power and conditioning, which great Thomas needs that. But mostly to me, it says something about his mentality. It says something about a change in his mentality that now he's like taking uh, responsibility for his own future and doing something to make himself better. That's great. I love that. And it's coinciding with this improvement in his play. I think it's not a coincidence. So that's really positive. Do you think the club has any um, negative reaction to him going outside of the club to do extra training or concerns about that? Uh, I probably not because NFL guys do it all the time, you know, and guys do it. Guys will go work with Scott Seeley. Uh, guys will go work with Kenny Cooper, you know, the work on fitness, speed, power, whatever they want to work on outside of the normal parameters that happens all the time. All I mean, right. they, they may not like it, but you know, in some ways tough shit, if the kid's looking out for himself. So good. Um, good. and then a couple other North Texas notes, it looks like I'm hearing Nikki Hernandez, who's an SMU player is going to jump ship and join North Texas. That's he's a quality kid. That's a good move. I think Kevin Benny is coming. When you wait, when you say jump ship, you mean he's, he's giving signings. His, so yeah. he will forego his college career completely, or is he just doing yeah. this this year because of the COVID situation? Well, he would have been a senior this fall. So oh, I'm pretty okay. sure it's like, what's the point? I mean, he cut, I think they all would have rolled over and gotten an extra year, but does he want to wait a whole other year to play a season or does he want to wait all the way to the spring? I think he's, you know, I believe it's a pro deal with North Texas. He's a former Dallas Texans kid. He's a linking eight kind of player. So, um, you know, again, that's something Dallas has lots of, but North Texas right now needs some of that. And he's a good player. So he, he might've been a first round draft pick coming up. Mm-hmm. So they're basically circumventing the draft Dallas is, which I love that. Um, and then Kevin Benia is coming back because Portland's basically not playing. So he's going to come back and play on an amateur contract because this would have been his freshman season. So he's not going to burn his eligibility. And then Arturo Rodriguez is coming back. Dallas has ended his loan to um, RSL Monarchs. So he's going to come back and play. So that's all interesting. But here's the biggest one, and that's the goalkeeper. Did you want to say something else or should I Well, go no, on? the Arturo situation, is, is, he, is his return from RSL related at all to the nuttiness that's going on in terms of management over there? Or was he just not yeah. getting time? Or Well, what? the whole organization is a dumpster fire, yes. But he wasn't getting time because uh, I believe their coach's name is Olave. You remember, remember him as a player. He's a very direct strength power. So it was a oh, mismatch yeah. in terms of yeah. Arturo doesn't play like that. Arturo is a creative passing, slow it around, move it around. You know what I mean? So bad fit situation and that organization is a dumpster fire. So he's coming they, back. Are, is, are they in, are they in us, uh, uh USLC okay. championship? Okay. Yeah. They're, they're more interested in results than developing Arturo. So okay. why, why not come back and play here and, and then get something new next year? Anyway, you sounded excited to tell us something else. Well, I'm not excited about it, but it's an interesting piece of information. Like people, FC Dallas brought in a pool keeper this week. Um, this Charlie Lyon. And so people have wondered, well, why didn't you just put Alvarez as your keeper on the bench? Well, the answer to that is, is that Al, uh, Carlos Aviles is no longer an FC Dallas player. What? It tur- it, yeah. It turns out that. Didn't they just sign him to a homegrown deal they like did. six weeks ago? I'm going to explain it. Yeah. <laughs> they, Sorry, I just, it turns I'm a little out, I know. It turns out that his homegrown deal was a short term homegrown deal. So when, like, um, within, after a month, it was basically a short term contract to take him to Florida and just sort of see if he could fit the bill. And the answer was he didn't. So when the contract expired after the end of a month or two, whatever it was, they did not renew the contract. So he was out of contract and he was no longer an FC Dallas player. And he re-signed a new deal with North Texas SC. So that's why Carlos, you, you'll see pictures of him in FC Dallas training, but you will not see him on any FC Dallas game day roster because he is no longer on the FC Dallas roster. He's a North Texas player only. If that makes sense. You know what, Buzz? After this podcast, we need to give all of these uh, breaking news nuggets uh, that you've been uh, putting out uh, an official name. And I'm Dan. I'm I'm going to vote for Huntsman Dumps. How about that? <laughs> That's magical. You like that one? <laughs> yeah. Do so, another Huntsman Dump. Yeah. So uh, Buzz uh, Buzz uh, gave us two Huntsman Dumps, two steamy dumps today with the Cobra news and the uh, goalkeeper news. That's Sounds good like stuff. two thumbs down right in the game. <laughs> <laughs> I give it two dumps. 
<laughs> two Huntsman dumps. <laughs> All right, so now Dallas travels uh, to uh, – does not travel. I'm sorry. They are back home this weekend against the hated Houston Dynamo, who, boy, that team looks like they've improved quite a bit since the last time we saw them. Uh, the game's at 7.30 mm-hmm. on Saturday evening up at Toyota Stadium. I, I'm assuming there are tickets to be bought for – the uh, people that do want to go. Any predictions in terms of lineups or returning players uh, for the game on Saturday, Buzz? Well, I'm pretty convinced that Reynolds will keep the right back spot and that Hollingshead will go back to the left back spot. If Hedges is back, uh, you'd think a 4-2-3-1 would be in order. I think Ricarte will never come out of the lineup again. I think Hara will never come out of the lineup again. Um, Fafa Pico's not ready. Uh, um Mauer's not ready, so Zobeck's in goal still. Uh, left wing will be a big question mark. I don't know who's going to play over there. Um, Pepe was okay. Maybe it'll be back to Jesus. We'll have to play that one, but we'll see how it goes. Um, there is some thought to that. You remember that Dallas went three at the back against Houston before, I think, if I remember right. I might remember they right. They did, yeah. No, they, yeah, they, so might they still go with Brisson? I don't know, man. That second half looks so good with Ricarte. So I, I, today I'm predicting four at the back with Ricarte in the midfield. I'll, I'll say if I'll change my mind later if I think about it more or if I get any word of mouth. But um, that's basically it. The big things will be the Reynolds Hollings head right back, left back, I think. Pretty confident in that. And Ricarte, you know, never coming out of the lineup ever again. Now, we don't think Ricarte can go 90 minutes yet, though, do we? Probably not. Probably not. But um, – you know, they, they got guys that could fill in there. Jesus could fill in there if, he, if he's not starting or he can flip-flop positions. Or um, Thomas Roberts has played pretty well, as I said, for North Texas, so maybe he could do 10 minutes. Or, you know, Tessman can come in and, and along with whoever else in there too. So they got some people that can do that job for yeah. 20 minutes. And one of the things that we forgot to note in our review of the game was for as good as Dallas did look, there was a good percentage of that when Minnesota was playing a man down. So there's a little bit of, uh, of an asterisk there in Fair. terms of, uh, of the, that, we, that we forgot to mention. Right, Dan? Oh, it was only, what? Was it, it was like 10 the minutes. Last eight minutes? Yeah. Well, well, there was five minutes of injury time, and I think it happened in the 80th minute. So I'd say at least 15 minutes total in the actual game time. Yeah. Okay, so about like a... You know, a third quarter of the the time that they actually chose to play. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Now, the other thing I just quickly want to mention to everybody, because this continues to be the most unstable thing uh, I have seen in some time. Does everybody understand that we do not yet know what happens with this league's schedule in less than a week's time? Yeah. Today uh, Today is we are recording on September the 10th. I think the Dallas Colorado game next Wednesday on the 16th is the last scheduled game. We don't know a schedule for phase two, and I think that's incredibly unstable. Yeah, Dallas has 14 games left on their schedule. Um, the athletic guys today said that MLS is about to drop like three more games for each team as the next phase. Basically, the Canada teams are the problem. So they're trying to figure out what the hell they're doing. Dallas has 14 games left. Okay, but go with me here. Doesn't that somebody's going to start looking at this schedule and wonder if it's being manipulated in some way? Well, I, I mean, I hope not. God, I mean, they're stuck with conference games. You know, other than that, I, I don't know what. And the, the Canada teams can't get into the country. They're going to have to come down here and camp out here for like months, like mini bubbles. I mean, I, that's enough of a problem as it is, right? Yeah, I mean, Dan, they're I'm talking a... about uh, Montreal playing, uh, going to play out of Red Bull Arena, Toronto. I saw that potentially out of New England. Um, I guess Vancouver's maybe the holdup. That Seattle seems the obvious choice for them. Yeah, there's several complexes that they could. Yeah, they could. Yeah, that makes sense. I just it just seems very weird to me as you get down through this. As if they're only going to start dropping a few weeks at a time, and I'm sure everybody's going to say, look, Peter, this is a scheduling nightmare. You can't expect us to figure this out way in advance. But, man, it just seems ripe for kind of like setting up games based on, you know, this and that. And, man, it's just going to create all sorts of speculation and conspiracy theories. Well, it the, just is really weird. By the sounds of the stuff the uh, the guys at The Athletic were talking about, it's it's more that Phase 2 will actually 
will be the three games, and then Phase Three will drop in its entirety. Ah, uh, okay. It's well, it's going to be a, two games a week. Is going to be a whip for these squads. Yeah. Yeah. Boy, yeah. Yeah, and it's just going to be a hey, we need a couple more weeks to to just space this out and really get everything finalized. And, and help me remember, have they said or set a destination for MLS Cup, or is MLS Cup still the team that made it to the final that has the best record? We technically don't even know the format of the playoffs now. Oh, really? Uh, they haven't. Con- they haven't uh, confirmed. What happens with the ten or eight, uh, ten in the Eastern Conference and the eight in the West? Whether it goes back to that, because originally it was going to be, you know, first gets the buy and then everyone's kind of playing everyone and, and and building up in those single games. But yeah, it's it's going to be. I mean, it could technically be another bubble for all we know. Interesting. I don't know. It just seems really weird uh, that we don't have. Uh, we're a week out, and we still don't know what the schedule uh, for the coming, you know, the, the rest of September is. Even so, that's uh, pretty bizarre. All right. Um, anything else, uh, Buzz and or Dan, you would like to throw in this? How I have no idea how long this podcast is at this point. I suspect. Yeah, I mean, long. isn't it a lot? <laughs> <laughs> Currently, yeah. we're sitting at about eighty minutes. Oh, very nice. Well, you know, those Huntsman dumps are quite big, and they take yeah. up a lot of effort and time. It was I have the hugest. <laughs> my, my, my dumps are notoriously big, <laughs> famously big. <laughs> Gross. So many cold <laughs> opens. Yeah. I, I, I'm going to regret that one for quite some time. All right. Uh, uh, well, uh, Dan, thank you for your participation in the pod today. As always, you uh, are, are a welcome addition. Thanks. Does that mean I can stay in the country? Yes, apparently so. I, you are all papered up and everything, aren't you? I, I have papers. Are you a full time? Are you an American resident, like an official citizen? I am not a citizen. I'm a lawful permanent resident. Hmm. Are you working on your full residency? Uh, I think I'd have to be here a little while longer to do that, but I don't know. We'll see. It's just... one Let's of get back times... to soccer. Hey, Buzz, one of these times when we're a little low on content, can we let Dan tell us his story? Because I don't yeah. even think I know Dan's story about how he ended up in the country and what he's doing here and all well, that stuff. He had a hat, and uh, he's quite mad for it, and that's it. Okay. But, yeah, we can hear the whole story. All right. And nice uh, Buzz. reference. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, Buzz, thank you uh, for all your uh, dumps today. Uh, that was big stuff, and I hope everybody feels like they uh, the tease was, was well paid off uh, from your tweet earlier today. Well, you're welcome, and thank you for rearranging the deck chairs. Yeah, no problem. And thank you, FC Dallas Curious Fan. We'll speak to you next week on another edition of Third Degree, the podcast. Good luck, Reggie.